You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. My coping mechanism was making sure that I don't need anyone. I became extremely self-sufficient because I never wanted to hear that again. Like I never wanted to be in that situation again, to be vulnerable, right? To be at mercy of someone else. Anthea Boyd studied personality psychology at UC Berkeley. She is also a neurolinguistic programming specialist. She was certified in dream coaching, and she has spoken on hundreds of stages and radio shows, including Harvard and Google. She's also been featured on ABC Radio, America Trends TV, and The Great Love Debate. Born in Germany, she now lives in San Diego with her amazing husband of six years, and she loves helping women magnetize the right man for a loving, lasting relationship. Welcome to the show. Hi there. <laughs> um, so we always start with what does woman of value mean to you? Yeah, a, a woman of value to me means really being a woman, being in her queen. So what I say about that is it's like the balance between the bitch and the doormat. So she has the warmth and the connection and the compassion of the doormat, but she also is able to set boundaries unapologetically, meaning she's also connected to what she needs. She's self-focused as well. And that is really making that powerful woman of value. Hmm. Never heard that one before. So to you, the bitch is the person who sets boundaries and the doormat is warmth and compassionate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the doormat also doesn't have boundaries, but that's why I say it's the middle ground of the two, right? So it's like the doormat with boundaries and self-focused because the doormat is other-focused, way too other-focused. She totally loses herself. And the bitch is obviously way too self-focused. She couldn't care less about anybody else and is very aloof and disconnected. So she's, she's right in the middle. She's balanced, right? She's not too much other focused or self focused, but she knows Correct. how to be a good balance of both. I like that. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. I think many of us grow up thinking we have to be other focused, right? Like we have to always put everyone else first and it feels really selfish to put yourself first. And it's a huge cost if you don't. And so my whole evolution has been to go from other focus to focus on self first, really primarily to know what is it that I want and need. And, and in order to get needs met, you've got to first identify them and then set boundaries around them. So this is, this is really in alignment with who I am and what I teach and what I believe in. So I love it. Antia, what is your aha woman of value moment that the times or time in your life when you woke up to your own value? Yeah, uh, gosh, there's so many, but the one I picked, uh, I saw it sat down with my husband. I'm like, there's so many, which one is like, uh, so one, one, one I picked was um, one thing that was always really important to me was authenticity and transparency. But I, for a while, I was also really scared of being vulnerable. So I was like, what if I'm like too authentic and that I'm going to lose the man or he thinks something bad about me or I'm inadequate or we have all those fears, right? That, um, that if we don't look polished and if we don't look perfect and if we don't look well presented and we're like, oh, by the way, there's a little monster in the closet. Uh, out of the sudden, the man is running for the hills. So I made a dis uh, decision after I moved in with my husband. So I met him um, in Hawaii and then, you know, we uh, moved in like about a, uh, yeah, a month after he proposed to me, which was eight months later. Um, and we had this moment where I was annoyed at something. I don't remember what it was, dishes in the sink or something similar to that extent. And I was like, you know, I know he responds really well to like guilt, right? Like, so I could just guilt trip him. I could just sort of like manipulate him. Obviously I'm not thinking that conscious, but like, you know, something to that extent so that the listeners understand it better. And, um, but then I was like, but no, wait a minute. No, my, my value is authenticity and transparency. So then I was like, 
well, then wait a minute, does that mean now then I have to tell them what I just thought? Because what I think, what I say, and what I do needs to be in alignment um, in order for that to be true. And so I did. So I, I went up to my husband and I said, so, hey, honey, I just wanted to share something with you. And of course, by the way, hello, my mind was saying, okay, auntie, you're totally nuts. You could lose him now. He will never trust you again, right? Like he, he will manipulate you. Now you're going to create this barrier. So you, I had this part of my mind, right? That was just like saying, you're crazy. You're nuts. But I did it anyways. So I said, you know, um, well, to make a long story short, my ego just wanted to manipulate you, right? And so, so my husband, Ivy, totally have this context for the words and, you know, he knows what that means, right? So he's like, oh, really? Like, how, how did you want to do that? So that's what I mean, right? So actually, when we're authentic and transparent with each other, what then happened was actually authentic engagement, right? Like, so he was like laughing and actually his nervous system relaxed. Because it's like, wow, if she tells me that, I, I don't have to look out for myself all the time. Like, I don't have to, you know what I mean? Like, put a barrier in between us or, you know what I mean? Like, hesitate or withdraw or shut down. But um, actually, the opposite is the case. Yeah, no, it's you. I love you sharing the whole thought process because you went through... I could guilt him. <laughs> I could manipulate him. That's worked in the past. And so, yeah. so many people stay stuck there. Like, I'm going to continue this because it works. Mm -hmm. But it was against your values. And in that, that drive to be authentic, to be transparent, you took the brave and courageous route to really say to him, look, this is my thought process. I was about to manipulate you. And my ego wanted to. But... I'm, I'm just being honest with you. And that honored you and it also honored him, which I love. And look at how he responded with humor, with lightness, with love, instead of driving a force and a wedge. Because guilt can work in the moment. It can incite fear. It can make somebody not do something because they, they don't want to piss you off. But in the long run, it's not going to change behaviors. Mm-hmm. And it actually erodes the trust, right? So what happened after I shared it with him, then, you know, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, he's like, hey, so I want to share something with you. My runner is coming out right now. And that's how he normally shows up. And so, et voila, out of the sudden, we have like an incredibly next level of emotional intimacy in our relationship where our friends are thinking, wow, that really, you guys talk about that? He told you that? Like... I would be so scared, you know, or, 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 or the man would be scared that the woman gets anxious and the little girl gets scared, you know, the inner little girl. And I was like, no, but we have that foundation, right, of emotional intimacy. Because we always say we want this deep, connected, long-term, enriching, you know, relationship. And I was like, ah, are you willing <laughs> to do what it takes for, to get there? It's not just going to happen like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> You got to have to lean into the edge, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, for people listening who are thinking like, I couldn't do this. I know that you've done a lot of work to get here. You know, it didn't come overnight. You, in fact, I think you met your husband at a self-help kind of spiritual mm -hmm. kind of retreat, right? Mm -hmm. So tell us yeah. a little bit about your journey because you grew up in Germany. You didn't have such a great upbringing. Um, just to give people a little bit of a... a window into how far you've come because you know you, where you are today is very far from where you started yeah which hopefully gives everybody a lot of hope so of course as you already um, adequately identified sandy so i grew up in eastern germany which back then was communist so uh, parenting was extremely unconscious kids were left alone for like up to a day if the mom had to go to the grocery store with the next, with the other baby. Here it's unthinkable, you go to jail if you do that. And um, so my mom was really emotionally absent, uh, narcissistic for sure. And so what that looked like was, you know, picture me, let's say um, I was about one and a half years old, right? And I was trying to crawl into my mom's bed because that's what you do. You wake up in the morning, it's way too early, mom's still sleeping. But in that moment, my mom actually rolled over and said, Stör mich nicht which means don't bother me, right? And that don't bother me message became the core message 
of my belief system. So I built everything on that, right? So I, for, for one, I went through a tremendous amount of desperation, which every child does, because it's like you depend on your primary caregiver. And if that doesn't happen, right, there is a disconnect that has to take place at some point because the nervous system is so aggravated and it's a, a panic, in panic, because it's like my caregiver just told me she's not taking care of me. So what I did, um, Sandy, I developed a coping mechanism. And my coping mechanism was making sure that I don't need anyone. I became extremely self-sufficient because I never wanted to hear that again. Like I want, never wanted to be in that situation again, to be vulnerable, right? To be at mercy of someone else. Now, as you can imagine though, now I was a pa walking past conflict. On the one hand, I still wanted that deep connection and that deep intimacy. And on the other hand, I was like, I got it all together. I'm good. I, I'm so okay. You know what I mean? Um, everything is good in my world. And it pretty much stayed on the surface. So of course, now moving along as a walking path conflict, what do I attract? Well, guess what? You attract who you're being to yourself. So I attracted other walking path conflicts into my world, also known as emotionally unavailable men or you know, narcissistic men or avoid an attachment style men. So you may have heard different labels um, and who left me abandoned, of course, right? Like they would always make me promises and then don't follow through, which by the way, that was my dad. That was my dad wound, right? We have a ma mother wound and then we have a da uh, father wound. And the father wound for me was like lots of promises, no follow through. And so mix those two together, Sandy, and it was a recipe for disaster. I never even made it into any kind of relationship, like, because there's so much drama and so much anxiety and so much withdrawal happening all the time that by the time I was dating a man about maybe even just two months, I was exhausted. I was depleted. I was done. So I said, look, you got to do something different, right? Like if you want to have a massive shift in your life and you're kind of sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I got myself into UC Berkeley and said, look, I'm going to study this on an academic level. Maybe that's what it is, right? So I studied personality psychology, particularly attachment style theory under the master student of Mary Ainsworth, who of course was studying right under John Bowlby, who's the grandfather of attachment styles. And now we're really getting into it, but I'm a nerd about that for sure. And that started to answer questions for me. However, just on an intellectual level. So the journey here starts also with understanding that when we have our coping mechanisms to be self-sufficient because we don't want to bother anyone, everything stays in the head. Like you really leave your body all the time, right? You're like just trying to figure out everything in your mind because that's quote unquote, the only thing you can rely on is the certainty, right? Body is like uncertainty. No, no, no. I don't want to go there. Like that's no, 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 no. And so, um, yeah. So from that moment on, I just really understood, okay, I need to do a little bit more. I need to understand more, um, you know, talking to different uh, men, understanding men, you know, like masculine, feminine dynamics, you name it, I did it. And um, at the same time, I still didn't know that I was not in my body. So this is the thing, by the way, most women that come to me, Sandy, they're like, oh, I've done it all. I'm like, oh, I get it. <laughs> but how about the visceral level? How about the emotional level? How about the energetic level? Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. What's that all about? That's what I uncovered, right? When I hired my um, mentor for myself after, by the way, I was another time the maid of honor. You know, those like movie, I wrote us like 49 weddings or where she's like the maid of honor all the time. So that was me. <laughs> all the weight of all the dresses in my, in my closet, <laughs> helping everybody else, but can't help myself. Right. Um, and look, a pivotal moment for me was uh, December 31st, uh, 2000. And uh, well, that would be then 11 because I'd met a ton of men, but the problem was I, I had like got one, like one kiss or something like that. Like, and I was like, wait a minute. So the exposure is there because we're always saying, oh, I just need to know, meet the right man. Or I just need to have the right opportunity. I just need to have the right job or the right, whatever. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's more like what happens when that's in front of you. Right. And then I realized so there's something inside of me that I don't know that I don't know, which was the scariest thing for me, right? Because as German, 
I need to know everything. I'm competent, right? And so that's, a fish doesn't know that it's wet. That's what my husband always says. And that's what I really learned, right? After, um, after I really hired um, a mentor that really helped me to be vulnerable, like really to be vulnerable, not to just show up and be like, well, they told me to say this on a date and I did, and I did this, right? And then also to set boundaries without guilt. Because remember, my mom, narcissist, they know how to guilt trip. And so that's like when I, you know, about like, what was that? Like seven and a half months later, I met my husband, Brody. And by the way, at a spiritual discussion group, you got that right, Sandy. And the first night that we met, he told me that I'm the girl of his story. And also the first night that we met, he told me that we have a huge responsibility to humanity because I know we're going to get to the mission later and what the future looks like and things like that. That's when, so that's what happens when you transform, right? I was aligned and now I finally attracted a man who was fully aligned as well and who followed through on his actions. Wow, what a story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I knew parts of it, but I didn't know the whole thing. So this is so relevant to so many women. You know, when we learn the right tools, we can really overcome so much and have the life we want to have. Because like you said, you know, the men were showing up, you were there, you were meeting people, you just weren't able to get a Brody. <laughs> so I love that he recognized you and you recognized him and that also you had a mission together, which you actually do have a mission together. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk. I mean, you, there's so many things, so many places we could go, but um, I would love to add something on. Um, yeah, please, because I have so yeah. many questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So, so one thing, because we were talking earlier about the transparency and um, the authenticity, and uh, part of our mission was actually bring the shadow and the light together. So the night before our wedding, we did what we call a shadow ceremony. So that's just also like something really distinct, like really leaning into the edge, because I always like to think about what does that actually look like in everyday life? You're talking about concepts here, but how do I actually integrate them, right? And so we actually admitted to each other our deepest, darkest fears. So when we're talking about the foundation of authenticity and transparency, because you see, you go into the wedding, you make all those promises, or you go into your new job or whatever, right? And everything is going to be pink roses, everything's going to be wonderful. Um, but actually a part inside of you knows that that's not true. Like we have two parts inside of ourselves. And uh, to really acknowledge and be like, oh, by the way, my biggest fear is like that I'm not good enough, uh, which I know we're going to talk about later too, Sunny. And, and Boris is like, you know, his fear to be trapped because his mom was all about the guilt tripping in a different way that my mom, but say, you know, came a little bit from a different angle, but still guilt tripping. And so to acknowledge that like in the actual ceremony and be witnessed by that, right? Like that, you know, I mean, <laughs> the attendees were thinking for a moment, uh, wait, am I at a breakup or am I at a <laughs> wedding? I'm not quite sure right now, you know, <laughs> you could hear like the needle drop, you know, <laughs> and then we're like, and now we're releasing it all. He was like, okay. Ooh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it takes courage to do that. And I, I love it. I, I think the more we can be honest and open with each other from the very start, the more we can handle stuff. And I think often in couples that don't work out, it's the unspoken. When, when someone believes that their mate can't handle it, you know, so I'll seek support somewhere else because mm -hmm. my darkest side is too much for them or my fears are too much. And if I actually voice my fears, then the person might push me away, um, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I see that all the time at the beginning of a relationship, you know, like something's moving too fast and the, guy, and the woman is afraid to say, I need to take my time. This feels, mm -hmm. this doesn't feel comfortable to me. Just getting mm -hmm. used to saying those things like I, you know, or, or you know, I remember, you know, when, when somebody wants to sleep with you before you're ready, 
you know, to be able to say like, there's a part of me that would love to sleep with you, but that hasn't worked out well for me in the past. You know, I kind of crash and burn my relationships and I really care about you and I want to make this work. So I want to take it a little slower. How does that work for you? We're having a conversation. We're not like just cutting someone off and how dare you push me and, you know, all those fears speaking instead of the vulnerability speaking. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you could give us some examples from your life about like, how this works in your relationship like a fear comes up or you know you've talked a little bit about it but i'd love to hear more like how you handle it differently than other couples yeah yeah absolutely um so you know we talk a lot about when we notice that for example shame shields come up renee brown talks about shame shields which is three behavioral ways that you can respond to when shame comes up right so you either go into attack right? Like, oh, it's your fault. And who do you think you are? And right, that was my dad, by the way, he had a total um, attack shame shield, which by the way, my core message from my dad was, who do you think you are? Believe it or not, right? And, uh, and then the second one is denial. Oh, just, just kidding. Just was, it was just a joke, right? Like, I, I didn't really mean it. Um, and the other one is collapsing into it. Oh my God, Sandy, you're so right. Oh my God, I should, just, I should be so shamed on myself. But all three are actually shame shields, right? So what we learn, like I, uh, I had a lot of suppressed anger, Sandy. This is like a really vulnerable thing to share. But I had a really suppressed anger because my dad was raging. And, uh, but I was never able to express that because it was not safe to speak up. It would have never been safe. My brother got beaten for it, right? So I'm like, oh, note to self, zip the lip. Because at least I was never, and he never put hands on me right? Because I was just quiet. But once I actually started to have a relationship where I felt safe and where I felt fully accepted, guess what? All those unaccepted, unexpressed emotions are going to bubble up to the surface. So all of a sudden, I became the biggest biatch that you could ever imagine. I'm like, what is going on? I'm just like rage. I become physical. And it just... I mean, I never ha- had been in a long-term relationship ever, right? So I never had someone hold space. And, um, and that was really powerful for me to actually express with Brody and Brody actually holding space for it, right? And we learned for me to not target it, of course, like at him, but actually like move it through, create expression sessions where I just punch the pillow, where I scream. And it was really vulnerable because imagine you you know yourself sort of as this like, happy-go-lucky person and out of the sudden you're like this rage monster and you're like what is happening what's taking over me right and I think uh, a big part that transformed things for us was so after I expressed it for a while and he held space right at some point you feel like I'm looping you know what I mean I'm not getting anywhere it's just the same now I'm reactionary right first it needed to come out which is understandable but then now I'm reactionary, which means then what is the authentic emotion underneath? And that was our next level of evolution in our relationship was actually seeing that it was panic, which to me, remember, self-sufficiency, right? So panic to me would actually symbolize what exactly I was running away from, this like feeling needy, feeling helpless, like totally collapsing into my helplessness was terrifying to me right? Like I rather was, would be in rage and like attack. That was my shame. She was attack. Right. Um, and, and for, and for him, like to really, again, continue to hold it for me to actually talk about it, to be like, I don't want to, I don't want your, see there's different parts inside of us. Like when it's like a little boy, the little girl and so many different archetypes. And Woody and I talk about that. And I said, you know, I feel that my rage, my anger has a lot of impact on your little boy. Like he feels like terrified. He's so sweet and so loving, but he's like very loving, a very friendly person. You know what I mean? And so I said, you know, I want to just like, what impact does it have on you? What can we shift? And again, that was really vulnerable for me because it brought up more shame. Cause like, Oh my gosh, that little boy inside of him. I'm, I'm, but that's what we women do, right? What we do is, we're we're attacking a man in such a way that the heart, the little boy, which is the heart of the man, starts to shut down, right? And that's what I learned is actually to guard my husband's heart 
and he'll guard me physically with his wild man, all that stuff, right? But I had to guard him because we're always talking about we want to be guarded. We want to have like our guardian, right? But it's the other way around that I actually learned and that was really vulnerable for me, like to be the guardian of his heart and just really be, yeah, you can feel it yeah. still. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It's amazing to hear the evolution. I mean, learning, first of all, being able to understand where all this is coming from, the rage, there's so much unexpressed emotion. You've held it in your whole life. I mean, how could you not have unexpressed rage? Yeah. And being able to have a safe space to let it out and have him hold the space for you mm -hmm. and all the conflict that went on in that moment as well. Like you're feeling bad that you're hurting his heart. He's, you know, you bringing up more shame. <laughs> he shuts down, you shut down. Mm -hmm. And you, you see so often that so much can be thwarted with the right emotional skills we understand that most of most of our anger comes from hurt and sadness and wounding, and uh, it comes from a small space within us that had never healed, you know. And and when and we're so afraid of it, you know, especially women. Women are so afraid of their anger, and 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 it's important to understand it, you know. And and a lot of times, anger also is a catalyst for something we really believe in. It's like it shows us like somebody stepped on something important to us and we have to express something, but learning to do it in a way that doesn't attack and hurt the other person. So it sounds like you both have such an understanding of each other about what you need in those moments and how to support each other that it helps the, the relationship really thrive. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say definitely it comes from a place of mutual respect right? Like we respect each other too much to, you know what I mean? To go into those like mechanisms towards each other, right? We're like, okay, how can we handle this better, right? Like how can we support each other? Um, yeah. That's such an important foundation to respect each other and to always keep the relationship in mind when, you know, so like you start, we started out with what's a woman of value. It's that balance. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I am warm and I'm loving. I'm not a doormat. And I also know how to set those boundaries. So mm -hmm. how can I be both in support of this relationship as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And my husband has no problems with that. Like he, he would put me in my place. Like he would be, <laughs> but so many clients that come to me are like, you know, I need a man who puts you in your place. I'm like, Oh yeah, you gotta, he's going to put you in your place and he's not going to waste a lot of words. That's not going to be a lot of words, but it's going to be very clear. It's going to be very clear. You'll be like, okay, got it. Got it. You know, I'm not going to yes. do that again. <laughs> and you have to be able to handle it. I think the more, the more work we do on ourselves, the more we realize it's coming from a good place and we don't get defensive and try to deflect. And, you know, that's where a lot of the issues come. It's like, yeah, and it's you curiosity. do this, right? <laughs> yeah, it's curiosity. Like my husband always says, he's like, uh, we, we talk about it, like, I don't know, every month or so, uh, we talk about what we love about each other the most or what we've noticed the most, which by the way, I highly recommend because life goes so fast. You know, we have our everyday routines and, um, and he's like, I'm so amazed how you're always just curious. Like I say something to you that's like a little bit uncomfortable for you. And then you're like, yeah, you're right. Huh. Because remember, I don't want to use a shame shield. So I don't want to collapse into it. I don't want to deny it. I don't want to attack, right? So all I can do is just, yeah. Huh, interesting. Yeah, you're right. Like, I, I, okay, let me sit with that, right? Like, so I'm not doing any of those three shame shields. And so that has gotten us really far because, you know, when you become defensive in a relationship, your partner learns that. And they're like, well, I'm just not going to say anything anymore. So when women come to me while well, my partner shuts down, well, I want to know way more what happened before all of that, right? So there's like a whole series of events that happened. Um, I'm sure he was saying something at some point and you just became defensive and he was like, I, I'm done, you know, there's no point. Yeah, there's no safety in, in that relationship because Correct. people have learned. I mm -hmm. say something, I try to express myself and I get shut down, so I'm done. Yeah. And then so much is left unsaid and we continue the spiral and the, the, the way that the relationship starts to fall apart more and more instead yeah. of building it like you do. 
uh, which is so beautiful. So let's, you know, for people who are listening who have triggers, because a lot of this is about being triggered, can you share, like, I know your process is, is almost rote at this point, right? <laughs> you know, you, you know how to process your emotions, you know how to speak up, you know how to um, identify the shame shields and to get curious. What can our listeners do? Do you have like a, an exercise or something they can do? Oftentimes, so most women that come to me, they have an anxious and avoidant attachment style, meaning when they feel anxious, that means they get clingy, they think about the guy all the time, right? Like they try to do something different. So the trigger is like, I feel anxious, let's say, right? Or panic or whatever you want to call it, depending on what level of evolution you're on. But it's definitely panic in the system, but you may call it anxious um, or needy. And so then normally what, what women do is like, oh, I feel needy. I just need to call my friend. I just need to like pretend I'm not needy um, versus actually saying, how can I turn my trigger into my treasure, right? So, okay, great. Okay, I'm feeling needy right now. And so what I notice is actually, first of all, acknowledging it and not like kind of already pushing it to the side. And then actually, so what I visualize is really open up into it. So it, can you magnify the neediness? So just visualize yourself as if you expanded your neediness right like and you could either visualize that if you would call them a hundred times or whatever you want to do but just like take this to the max because what the worst thing that can you can do is suppress because you just elongate the process but if you actually look at the monster right in the eye so to say right it becomes smaller you know fear is the only thing that when we look at it it becomes smaller right um so then what happens is so then you look at it right like you're whatever it is and by the way don't attach a story to it just feel what's so like okay my heart is beating i feel anxious uh, you know whatever is going on right but like just try to not think about it's because of joe schmo or this person didn't call or whatever the case may be and then actually see where it takes you so when i did this exercise for the first time it took me into my childhood and it really took me into this place of like feeling helpless again i was able to do that because and by the way, that was before I had a mentor and before I had, so you can do this. I know you can do this. I did that while I was driving because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm like, there's got to be another way um, <laughs> to do this thing differently, right? And so, and then actually seeing what's underneath it. So maybe underneath is more a grief or you know what? Maybe underneath there is a rage. Maybe there is an anger that your mom always overstepped your boundaries or your dad. Or, or right like nothing was honored for you right they were not there for you even though you deserved it something like that will bubble to the surface okay and so i love that because now the treasure actually starts to uh yeah i call it like bubble up almost like right like um what's another word that i could use um yeah i can't find a word right now and so it bubbles up inside of you right and then you can really see oh this is what this is really all about right it was really all about it's like me actually saying yes to my neediness which by the way a woman of value says yes to her neediness so if a man says you kiss too much or you too affectionate or you too all those fears that we have you just stand there yes okay what else what else is new like that's it that's you're right you're absolutely right you watch men actually back off and go into their own shame shield. If you're able to advocate for your neediness, for your maybe even clinginess, whatever it is, because it's not about the emotion itself, it's about how you relate to the emotion, right? Evan Pagan, Tony Robbins, they tell this meta emotion, the emotion behind the emotion. So are you confident with your neediness? Are you secure with your insecurity? That's the exercise I would love for you to start taking on. Really interesting. So you have a fear and now you create a story around it, right? So you take the story away and then you visualize it expanding. Like, mm -hmm. oh my God, what will happen if, um, and, uh, you know, I start stalking him or whatever. <laughs> I'm freaking out. I've made a hundred phone calls. I left 6,000 messages and, um, but so what's at the bottom of it would be um, a need to belong, a need to matter, I, you know, something like that. 
So, um, so, but there is a difference. And I love this because you, you know, you're really uncovering what's really at the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it's a true need of yours, then stand by it, you know? And I think that a lot of, a lot of women will feel like they're too much of something because they've been told that their whole lives, right? Yeah, absolutely. By the way, the story that I just told was, is a real story that I experienced 10 years ago. Another woman of, that's why I said I have so many women of value moments was this guy <laughs> literally said, you kiss too much. And I said, well, that's me. So we just figure it out right now. You know what I mean? Because there's nothing that's going to change. He's like, oh, just kidding, just kidding. And then he would like pursue me, call me. And he went on a trip and left me messages every day, right? Because here's the thing, men, women, I mean, it doesn't matter. Like whatever, whatever area you're in, I have like women who are now doing this with their coworkers. And the coworkers are like, they're like saying, oh, you're such a bitch. You're damn right I am. And then they just continue to work. And then they're like, wait, what? What? Wait, what just happened? <laughs> no, you're not a bit. I'm just kidding. You know what I mean? Like, just, no, I mean, you know what I mean? Just joking. Um, because people are so used to, they know that we are charged, that there's certain words that are charged. And so if they're no longer charged and you can be manipulated, they have to back off because they have nothing else. If they're like, yeah, just like you're telling me I'm beautiful. Okay. Uh, I'm needy. Got it. Uh, and now they get to sit with their own uncomfort, right? It's almost like saying you have a mirror and that reflects back to them, not to you. Mm -hmm. And now whatever they sent you, they have to be that uncomfort, that tension. They have to be with themselves. And I, I'm telling you, it's, it's extremely powerful. 2010, that was one uh, powerful moment for me. Life was never the same after that. Advocating for your neediness. I love that. It's People who try to get a rise out of you, if you don't respond, they don't get what they want. <laughs> so it's like, wait a minute, what? Or you're changing the script. You know, you're, you've been always in reaction to them. And now you're not anymore. And that's, that's the beauty of setting boundaries, of really speaking up, of being authentic. All of a sudden, people don't have the same response. And the relationship shifts. And they often don't like it. I, I, you know, but the right people will stick around and the wrong people will slough off. And right, so it's really great to do this work. Um, thank you for sharing that. It's a great exercise. So tell us what you're creating now. What are you creating in the present? Yeah, so uh, we're creating really power couples on this planet. And the reason why I say that is because there has been this movement of uh, women empowerment, which of course the Women of Value podcast is a fabulous example for that. And what Brody and I are standing for really that women being empowered within partnership. So really having that true interdependence because there's something to be said when you really have a man who is like can hold all of you. I call it all the colors of the rainbow. That means the rage monster the sad part that's collapsing, you know, the, the most hilarious, funny, silly part that's like too, too goofy to be true, right? It's like a woman comes into so much self-actualization, right? And then, and then of course, helps the man to get self-actualized as well, right? So it's like so incredible as a unit. And then raising self-actualized, empowered children, kids, right? So if you're thinking about the legacy, because that's what we're talking about the future too here, Sandy, right? That's really when we're healing the planet. That's really when we're making, uh, you know, a massive difference on a mass scale, like really, really integrating that in that family structure. The more self-actualized the parent, the more healthy the children are. I, I always said like we parents, a lot of parenting books get it all wrong they think we have to train the kids. It's all about training the kids. And I did a program with one of my children who was the most obstinate, fighting back all the time, stubborn. And it was really hard going through a divorce and not having the cooperation of my ex-husband. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so I said, well, I got to take this into my own hands. And so this program was called uh, Total Transformation. And the first part of it was the parent. Who are you? Who are you being with your child? 
you know, how do you set boundaries? Do you, you know, give in too often? Do you, do you say something and not follow through? It held us accountable. And I thought that was brilliant because that's where it starts. You know, what we are is what we, we get in the world. So I love this. It's like a big vision for change. And so how are you doing this? Yeah. So, I mean, for one, uh, you know, I teach my women really by bitch code because most women that come to me, like I told you, Sandy, um, are other focused, right? So it's really about, uh, bitch actually stands for, for boundaries, intuition, trust, confidence, and then also having that internal harmony, right? Because like so many women are actually out of harmony inside of themselves, right? So if you give away all the time and you're distorted all the time, you're like, I don't even know anymore. Do I agree with this person? I don't know. Uh, we get so caught up. We also don't trust ourselves. And then in that response, we don't trust other people, other men, first and foremost, right? But I always say, if you don't trust other men, first of all, let's go back to you. Because that means you don't even trust yourself. Because when you trust yourself, you naturally attract people um, that you can trust. When we go to intuition, it's like so often it's really getting out of our head. That's why I love this idea of like the power couple so much, right? Because when you have a man who's really holds space for you, and I'm not saying that you can't do this as a single woman, but it's just my own personal experience and that, therefore conviction. Uh, intuition, your gifts are coming through so much stronger because you don't have to hold the whole tent and you don't have to hold everything, right? So you can be more creative and you're like, oh, I just had this song come through my head. Or I just had this message come through my head, right? So you're much more connected to your body, which an embodied man helps you also to become more connected to your body. See, this is like the thing, right? So many women attract men who are not embodied at all. Uh, and then, of course, boundaries. You know, we already talked about that, Sandy. Uh, really, really important. And the biggest thing here really is, and I really want to stress this because you talk a lot about not enoughness, um, is really the intensity. Like celebrate your intensity. If you're big, if you're bold, if you're bright, go for it, girlfriend. You know what I mean? Be unapologetic. I saw something yesterday on Facebook and a woman was basically just describing that in her like online dating profile. And she said, and it's basically take it or leave it or something like that. It's something to that extent. It's like, good for you. Good for you. You know who you are. You know what I mean? <laughs> the men know what, what they're in for, right? I always tell my husband, he proposed to me the night after I was the biggest bitch to him. Literally, I actually said, Sandy, he's not going to propose to me anytime soon now, right? <laughs> and I think this is like another healing message for the women because they think, oh, if I'm like too big and too intense and too interrupting his energy, then he will not want to be with me. And well, he proposed to me a day later. So I don't know, ladies, you, you do your own math on that, you know? <laughs> but I always joke with him, I said, like, don't tell me you didn't know what you're getting yourself into. I was not <laughs> pretending to be somebody that I'm not. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but you have a good heart. You know, you weren't just being, it's all my, it's all me and nobody else. Like I, I watched the millionaire matchmaker, Patty Stanger, and she, she's yeah. got this big bitch personality and it's like my way or the highway. And it's so bossy that it's very off-putting. I find, you know, I, yeah. I, I yeah. love that she knows what she wants, mm -hmm. but I'm imagining that it's difficult for her to be in relationship because it's always her way, you know? Yeah. Totally. So it's a balance. Again, it's not just go ahead and everybody has permission to go and just say anything you want and never have to filter anything. And it's just, but with the right people, you don't have to worry about, I had a, I had a big outburst and I'm sorry, you know, mm -hmm. or just, I should, could have told you that in a different way. I, I just don't want people to take away the message. Just be whoever you want, whatever you want, just whatever. Somebody's going to love you for it. Yes. Don't suppress who you are. Right. But there's, there's a time and a place. And you also had trust built and you had a relationship and he knew who you were. All right. So the future, what is in store for you and, and Brody for the future? Yeah, I mean, for us, obviously, like, you know, family planning, like really raising uh, entrepreneur kids, we have like always those like visions, you know what I mean? Like having like all of our kids, like little assignments and they learn how to have all those skills to be entrepreneurs like Brody and I, um, being a little Brody and a little aunt here. And, and then also, yeah, really making a big difference in our community, right? Like continue to have 
gatherings, of course, outside of our business, you know, but even like whatever community we're in, uh, you know, we were traveling the world two years ago and wherever we were, we were in Bali for three months and we created community there. And so this like theme of like like-minded community, empowering community, how can we support each other in, in the shadows, right? And in the judgments and how can we create this like compassionate um, environment for, for, yeah, for not just each other, obviously, and the transparency, but also for our friends and for our, you know, partners in business and neighbors and uh, what have you. So that's definitely um, lots more traveling, um, having maybe two different places uh, we live. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, as we're filming this right now, we're in a very interesting <clears throat> situation. By the time this gets launched, maybe we'll be further along and know a little bit more. But yeah, enjoying the ride, you know, enjoying the ride of diversity and variety and uh, making a bigger difference on this planet. Mm, I love the mission. And I also love that you're open, you know, that you're not rigid. You're just open to, to exploring and seeing where it takes you. You, you took time off and traveled and, and saw the world. I mean, all of these things are so important in expanding who you are as a person and also as a leader out in the world. All right, we're going to the lightning round now. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, fill in the blank. I used to think I wasn't blank enough. Graceful. Graceful, interesting. What, is, what did that mean? Uh, so my dad would always say, like, I'm, I'm not graceful enough. Like, I was walking like a man, and I was doing this like a man. And I want to hear a funny joke. When I dated a guy, he actually Googled my name, and he said, did you know that your name, if translated, means grace? And I was like, well, that's kind of ironic. So, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, the irony of life, right? <laughs> That's so interesting. Uh, what was the number one thing holding you back from becoming a woman of value? Oh, we, yeah. I mean, thinking that, that my intensity is, is not welcomed. You know, it's not safe and it's, it's not ladylike and it's not, um, yeah, it's not adequate. What's the best advice you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? Uh, look at what you feel afraid of the most. Like what, look at what, what are you afraid of? You're going to be judged as when you go on a date, when you go on a job interview, you know, where, where are you covering something up? And actually that's, that's the goal. You know, that's actually like, okay, so I'm, a, I don't want to come up as too selfish, Well, maybe that's actually a good idea to be a little bit more selfish. Or I don't want to come up as like too arrogant. Well, maybe, maybe it's time for you to own a little bit more confidence. And maybe this is actually about like leaning more into your arrogance. So whatever it is for you, where you're like, I don't want to be too inconsiderate. Maybe you should be inconsiderate. Maybe you're too considerate. And you're always considering the other person. So that's a hundred percent always hands down. Um, the one thing that it's almost like this instant transformation that a woman can get at because everybody knows what they're afraid to be judged as. That's great. Be a little more of that. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice would you give to your younger self? You know, I thought about this a long time. It was actually meditate more, meditate more, like uh, remove yourself earlier from people that don't agree with you. Don't outsource your authority. Right. But instead actually do more of your spiritual work. I, I've done my spiritual work since I was 12 years old. I got my first Reiki degree when I was 12, but I didn't stay on it because, you know, as a teenager, my dad wanted me to do spiritual work, so I didn't do it because I don't do what my parents want me to do, right? <laughs> so, so I wish I would have like stayed on that um, spiritual work and just develop more my gifts, like my spiritual gifts, my clairvoyance, my clairaudience, knowing more, seeing more, hearing more, trusting myself more. What is something people get wrong about you? I think they think I have it all together, <laughs> to be honest with you, that they think, they think because I'm in a marriage, um, I don't want to hang out with anyone anymore, or I don't want to, uh, go out with girlfriends on a weekend or something like that. Yeah. And, and because I have a, we have a great business and all of that. We're, we're good. You know, we don't, we don't need any support or anything like that. So this, yeah, this whole like self-sufficient theme, of course, mm. that I developed. The old, 
the old theme, right? <laughs> yep, the old theme. <laughs> um, how would you like to be remembered? Uh, for me, I think it will always be being a connector, connecting people to each other, no matter at what level, that they always be, you know what, like at my funeral, people will be like, I met, I met you for lunch, oh, I met you for lunch, and they'll give all the speeches, how they met and how they got introduced. And uh, even if it wasn't like for a direct introduction, but maybe they met in my course, I have lots of, uh, lots of girlfriends that meet in my program that build businesses together. So uh, it will always be around connection, connecting to self and connecting to each other. Well, I met you through your connect connectability. <laughs> we were both part of the same group and you were there connecting people to other people. I remember that my first impression of you was, you know, putting people's names in, suggesting people for different summits, different podcasts, maybe this, you even did it with me recently which I appreciate. Um, so you are a master Mr. mistress connector, whatever you want to say. And I think it's a great thing. I, I think that you're not only connecting people, but you are, you are supporting people you are, and you're influencing people to be the best version of themselves and to have the best relationships. And I know that this conversation will be so inspirational to so many people. So I want to thank you for coming on today and sharing your really inspiring story with us. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, Please share it with others, because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.